You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. Well, I want to start off the show, um, I, I, I guess, just mentioning the Dwayne Haskins thing. I don't really know what to say exactly, but man, that is crazy. I saw messages in the Discord, and it just it's one of those things, it's like you just can't wrap your head around it, you know? I mean, you see stuff like that, but it's usually, you know, I don't know, a, a 89-year-old former Bears linebacker or something, you know, I don't know. Um, just just horrible. I don't, I don't really know what else to say about it. Not really going to comment on other people's comments on it. That's, you know, that's for them to work out, figure out, I don't know. Not really going to engage in that. But just just really sad, you know. It's one of those things where, well, it's one of those things that's just hard to accept that it's just one of those things, you know. This is one of those moments where society usually raises rises up and says we have to do something to make sure this never happens again, and we we've got to do so. We got to put in a policy. We got to do this or that, and you know, you really just step back and say, you know what? That's just it's just one of those things, man. It's just an absolute tragedy. And it sucks that there's tragedies like that in life, you know what I mean? So I think the only thing you can do, the best thing you can do, is recognize that stuff like that can happen to anybody at any time. Do with that information what you will. Hug your kids, stop fighting with your family, whatever. I feel like we've had enough reminders of this that we should be, we should be better at these things, but we're not. But anyways, um, like I said, I just, I just wanted to at least mention it because it was certainly worth mentioning. But I, again, I don't, I don't even know really what to say about that. Just horrible. But uh, anyways, just want to catch up on a couple things before we get back into the mock drafts, because again, I want to, today I want to spend a little bit more time, not just sort of grading and reviewing mock drafts, but um, really kind of diving in a little bit more and looking at some of these, uh, some of these fellas. But before we do, just want to kind of catch up on a couple things that I've been uh, not mentioning. Um, Wisconsin safety Scott Nelson, this is via Aaron Wilson who ran a 4.38 at Wisconsin's Pro Day and a vertical of 39 and a half inches is working out today, this was April 8th, for the Green Bay Packers and is regarded as a rising draft prospect according to league sources. It's kind of funny because um, I was listening to a podcast yesterday and there was a GM kind of doing an interview, which is always cool to get their perspective. Um, might spend a little bit more time talking about that in the near future, but Again, I've tried to. I've heard this from several people in terms of how GMs and scouts and all that stuff actually mention these things. And um, basically, although it's not entirely false, for the most part, what he's saying is nobody's rising and nobody's falling. He might be rising or falling among um, media sources, but there's really no teams who are um, viewing people that are are rising. Because everything's done. I mean, we we kind of joke about this all the time. As far as you know, how can somebody get better when there's nothing going on? You know what I mean? The combine's done. The pro day's done. The senior bowl's done. Certainly, the college season is done. How are guys rising and falling right now? Well, their rising and falling is largely because of of a couple different factors, but all of them have to do with the media. Number one, there are certain prospects that the media has not really come around to. So, for example. A guy like Scott Nelson isn't somebody that people have watched a lot of film on. 95% of the quote-unquote film that's being watched by fans in the media are first-round draft pro, first and kind of second E draft prospects. And, and by second, I mean people who are generally considered second-round picks but could potentially be first-round picks, which is pretty much every second-round pick or prospect. Beyond that, what you have are team leaks. Or, or potentially, you know, maybe hearing a little bit about, for example, Trevor Penning um, hearing rumors that he may be gone by the time the Ravens pick. Well, suddenly Trevor Penning isn't going to be falling to the 20s anymore. So he is technically, via the media, a rising prospect. Somebody who was seen as somebody that might go like 16, 17, 18, possibly fall to the Packers at 22, maybe even slide past him to 25, whatever, depending on what certain people think. Suddenly, everybody agrees this guy's a borderline top 10 prospect. He's rising because new information came out, but it's not new to the teams. Teams have largely set their boards. Now, he did go on to say that there are some 
situations where things will change. He mentioned one funny story where um, the scouts would occasionally come in and, and somebody had, had messed with the boards. You know what I mean? Whether it be the GM or, or whatever. Something had kind of been tweaked. And, and probably what that was. And he had mentioned how it, it gets a little heated. You know, the scouts, they've done all the work and everything else. And, but you got people banging the table. You know, you've got, uh, you've got scouts who want their guys. You've got coaches who want their guys. And, and as the GM, you're kind of, you got to sift through that and really stick to the process or whatever. But, um, you know, maybe somebody got in the GM's ear and he kind of shifted a couple things. But he said they'd kind of come in and chuckle and say something to the effect of, wow, there must have been another bowl game last night or something because I see the prospects have moved. But the point is, there's no reason anybody should be moving. There's no reason at this stage for any team to be really moving anything. There are slight adjustments that need to be made. For example, you might see, you know, with these, uh, the Packers bringing in a guy like Scott Nelson, you know, and you bring a guy in because you're not exactly sure. You want to kind of fine tune and tweak the board a little bit. But there's no massively rising prospects. There's no guy that's ranked 438th on their board that is going to shoot up to 114th. And even to be honest, and he, he had talked about this as well, the the combine doesn't really move things nearly as much. I had talked about when we listened to um, or read through what, who was it, Tony Pauline? No, no, it was um, Bob McGinn. And he had talked to a couple scouts and we had noted how in, on several occasions, not every occasion, but on several occasions, they kind of knew what these guys would run. And, and sometimes to a fraction of a second, they, they nailed it. Now, when somebody runs a little bit different, you kind of go back to the tape and maybe reassess and say, did we miss something? But he even talked about a couple of these guys where, you know, the times are really slow or the times seem really fast. And he said, I'm going to trust the tape. And, and that's the point. You go back and check and see what you see. But at the end of the day, if what you see on tape doesn't match up with the combine, you don't go with the combine time. So, for example, Traylon Burks, I'm guessing nobody cares about his combine time because presumably now maybe these guys go back, they look at his tape or, or, or they've always looked at his tape and say, yeah, that's about what he runs. But the point is, if they watch his tape and say, this guy runs faster than a guy that, you know, that, that runs at that speed. I don't care. Kyle Hamilton. I would be willing to bet teams are laughing at the idea that, that they wouldn't pick him because he ran like a 4-7 at his pro day. He even mentioned at one point this GM or, or former GM or whatever he was. I, don't, I honestly didn't know. What, I don't even know who he was. I tried to check the, uh, the comments. I'm like, who are we listening to? And I, I didn't see his name, so I don't, I don't even know who he is. But anyways, um, he had talked about, you know, they'll go back and reevaluate the, there was a tight end. I think it was Isaiah Likely. What did he run? Because that was the other thing is they, they didn't mention, they would say like once what the guy's name was, and I got accused of doing this too. And if you miss it, like you don't say the guy's name the rest of the time. I'm like, who are we talking about here? Are you talking about Weidermeyer? Which by the way, as I mentioned, well, I will mention today. I forgot that's, I recorded it yesterday. I'll mention it today, but um, I kind of like that guy. I know you're not supposed to. I didn't even bother watching him because it's like, this guy sucks. He's not even going to get drafted. But I don't know, man. I, I kind of like the guy. I was wondering why he wasn't falling off of boards quickly. And it's like, it's probably because his tape is actually pretty good. And so it was Isaiah Likely. I, th I thought for sure that he ran faster, but it says he ran a 4.8. And this guy was talking about Isaiah Likely saying, no way. And I, and I agree. I, I mentioned before, not knowing he ran a 4.8, that this guy looks like a wide receiver to me. He just does. I mean, he looks fast. He looks fluid. He's got the body control. He's, he's built almost the same way as Trey McBride, but it looks like Trey McBride is like 270 pounds and this guy's like 220 pounds. If, if, if I didn't know better, I would say that's the difference because he's just, he's built like a big wide receiver. I shouldn't even say built. He looks kind of stocky, but the way he moves, I mean, he's got no tightness whatsoever. But anyways, he, he went back and reviewed the tape of his 40 time and it said, you know, he had like three false starts. He had an awkward start with this one where his body moved forward first before his legs or something, something to that effect where, I mean, and that's the thing you're talking about fractions of a second. And with the 40 time, it's, it's not, it's different than football. You don't line up like that when you run a run 40 yards. It's a different thing. In fact, I don't know why they make people, they, they should do a different test for speed or, or maybe it doesn't even matter. Maybe this is like a dummy test because it's nobody is asked to do this. And if you look at how much you train and you drill for the 40, you're being taught to do a different skill. And it, the 40 time really judges how good you are at running a 40 time. At the end of the day, that's ultimately what it does. Now, it's not to say that it doesn't gauge speed, but there are going to be instances where guys get really, really adept at running that way from that stance. 
I, I remember watching, you know, people train for the 40 and there's a whole technique to it. You know, how you stand, how you set, I mean, how quickly you get out of your stance. I know laser time shouldn't matter, but at the same time, you think about likely if you kind of lean forward, that trigger, triggers the laser and then your feet kind of come a little bit later. And then you, you know what I mean? It, it's going to slow you down and you're kind of clunky. And there's this whole thing where you're supposed to like lean forward. And basically it's like you're falling and your feet kind of keep you up. And then you slowly, slowly, slowly stand up straight so that by the time you cross, you're just finally standing up. There's this whole thing about it. And if you don't do that well, and clearly with his three false starts and everything else. So the point is with Isaiah Likely and with some other guys, Kyle Hamilton, perhaps, they're looking at it and they're going, let's go back to watch the tape. And it's like, no. And, and again, I watch Kyle Hamilton. That's the most shocking thing in the world because that guy looks like he runs a 4-2. I'm ser- I mean, he covers ground. And it's hard to tell when a guy's six foot four speed, you know, tall guys usually look slower. And he does. I mean, he runs like a giraffe. You know, his legs don't move as quick as like Darren Sproles, who in my mind is still the fastest human being on earth because he's like five foot seven and his feet are just like tick, 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 tick. So he just looks fast. I don't I don't know how tall he actually is, but I just remember watching him run and thinking he's the fastest man alive. And really, it's just because his feet are moving so fast. Somebody actually sent me a video of that of two people running on a treadmill and there's like a, a smaller woman and then like a bigger guy. And the treadmill is set at the exact same speed. And this is who's running faster. And it looks like the woman is running twice as fast as he is. It's because her legs are kicking twice as fast. Her body's moving faster. It looks like they're moving faster. But anyways, Kyle Hamilton, dude, he covers ground like nobody else. And again, the point is tape always wins. And Brian Gutekunst has talked about that as well. 99%. And maybe, maybe it's just, you know, kind of GM speak, kind of like coach speak, where you say the right things, but at the end of the day, some of this stuff gets into your head. But 99% of your job is done when the season ends. It's all about film evaluation. Everything that matters happens on the field. When you judge speed, it's when you watch the tape. It's not at the combine. The combine just confirms what you believe. And again, if a guy like Isaiah Likely, if you're watching him saying, this guy runs like a four, five, six, he's got some pretty solid speed for a tight end, right? Four, five, six is a good time. And then he runs a four, eight. It's like, what the heck is that? There's no way. And you go back, what you do is maybe you go back and watch him run the 40 to see what was wrong. And then you go back and watch the tape and just say, nope, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm, that's not four, eight. It's not a four, eight. Now, maybe the three cone and the shuttle, which are also bad kind of plays in. And you might look at that and go, yeah, probably. Possibly. I don't know. Again, these are also drills, you know, I mean, and it does go to if you, I mean, the point is, if you are slow, you can't run a fast 40. If you've got, you know, tight hips, you can't do this. If, if you don't have explosion, you can't do that. You know, your broad jump isn't going to be good if you can't do it. But all these drills, in a sense, are kind of like the bench press. What, what, what do GMs always say about the bench press? What it shows you is if the guy's a gym rat or not. Because the bench press is something that you you just, you trained. It's not a, a gauge of overall strength. Now, granted, if you're really strong, you can bench a lot. And if you're not strong, you can't bench. But there are strong people that probably can't bench as much, especially when you're talking about high rep. You know, power lifters who can bench a massive amount of weight. Granted, they could rep 225 for a long time, but they're, they're also just not really built for that. So it's still going to give you an inaccurate idea of how much they can bench and how strong they are. But even that doesn't give you any idea or, or very little, you know, as, as, as far as how much is it translatable to NFL strength, it, it just isn't really. And I think we, we know that about the bench, but I think we don't know that enough about 40 time, three cone, shuttle, vert and broad jump. And again, I'm not saying these aren't important metrics. What I'm saying is we overvalue them and we, we refuse to acknowledge the reality that some guys just don't test well that play well. And I think we, we can kind of see that with 40 time. Again, if you haven't seen Weidermeyer, go watch him. Go see for yourself. I don't see a guy that's just slow and lumbering. And then go watch him and then go watch Jelani Woods and tell me who's faster. Because supposedly Jelani Woods is the fastest giant on earth. And Weidermeyer is, is, you know, he's like a sloth. He can barely move. If you go watch those guys side by side, and I'm not saying that I know for a fact that Weidermeyer would win in a foot race. I'm saying when you watch Weidermeyer, you see a guy that looks like a tight end. He looks like a big dude that, you know, I mean, he's not super fast. He's a big tight end, but but... He's a tight end, dude. There's nothing like, ooh, this is bad. But I watched Jelani Woods, and it's like, this guy is so slow. I mean, it's great that he's huge. I mean, you throw it up, and he's just, he's just, he's just massive. I mean, it, it, it's awesome. I mean, he's a third down monster is what he is. He's a red zone disaster for a defense. But he is not a guy that on your own 20-yard line is going to be 50 yards down the field just catching bombs, and he's going to outrun the deep. There's no way in the world that guy, I've never seen him outrun anybody in my life. So, I mean, that's a guy that tested really, really well that I, I, see, I don't see any play speed for him at all. 
again, I'm not, I'm not a GM. I'm not a scout. I don't know. I'm just, I've, I've, from what I've seen, and I'm talking about, watch his highlight reels and tell me if you see speed. I don't see it there either. But anyways, I thought that was a, a uh, <laughs> that was a lot to say about a tweet about a guy that visited the Packers. But um, the point is rising draft prospect means rising from a media standpoint. Um, the Packers, the Bears, the Chargers, all these guys, they know what they think of Scott Nelson with, with, you know, again, there's, there's minor tweaks and all that kind of stuff. But at this point, the boards are basically set. And, um, a lot of this stuff is probably settling arguments. You know what I mean? You, you've got a guy who's banging the table for this guy, Scott Nelson, whether that be Joe Barry, who's fighting to get his guys. Maybe it's our special teams coordinator who's fighting saying, I want that guy. Maybe it's our regional scout saying, you guys are stupid. You're not listening to me. I'm telling you, you know, whoever our Med- Midwest regional scout is, you freaking guys need to put him up on the board. I'm telling you, he's something special. And so like, all right, bring the, bring the kid in and let's, let's watch him. Let's see. But that's largely what this stuff is. There is nobody that's just like, the, the teams are like slowly moving him up the boards over and over. It's, that's not happening. But anyway, Scott Nelson. Currently, I've got 27th on my board. By the way, I think some really big overhaul is coming to my board. I got some help. Um, Pedro sent me something. I want to review that, but Jason Weber um, sent me something to... It's basically just a different formula of getting a, a top 10 ranking, and I think it's going to work a lot better. Um, just, just as far as removing outliers, because you have some of these... The, the biggest issue that I have, because by itself, outliers don't really matter all that much. Um, because it all just kind of averages out. The biggest reason I need 1 through 10 to be an accurate representation of 1 through 10 is when you look at quarterbacks compared to tight ends. Because if I have some metrics where everybody's low, it doesn't matter if I'm just comparing tight ends to tight ends because everybody's up against this unreasonable metric. So it, it'll kind of work itself out. But the problem is if the highest you're ever going to get a tight end is like an, a 91, like the best prospect in the world is a 91, and I've got corners, or other prospects who don't really have those negative, who are like 93, 94, 95, those guys are always going to be top of my board. So it's not really going to work out. So I need, when I see a guy that's got a good grade, he shouldn't have like a, a four out of 10 because of these outliers that are out there. So I'm really excited to kind of overhaul my board with this new formula and just see what the grades come out to. Um, I'm very excited. I'm actually very upset that I can't just sit here all day and do that with my board, but um, that will get done, and I'm very excited about that. Hopefully by Monday, it'll be completely done, because like I said, all I have to do is add quarterbacks and then just kind of upgrade or or uh, adjust all of the uh, formulas to a new formula, which will take some time, but considering how much monotonous data input I've done, um, it'll, it won't be bad. I'll, I'll knock it out pretty quick, and then I'll be able to go over to Patreon, and like I said, I, I think... I think maybe with each tier, I'll do something. So maybe even for the $1 tier, I'll just do, here's my board. And then for the $5 tier, I'll do something. And then the, you know, $10 tier, I'll, I'll make it even more in-depth and detailed and whatnot. So we'll see. But I'm excited to get that out. I'm excited to have my board set. I want to maybe start working on my own personal board. In other words, not based on this, but based on guys I like. It's going to be a much less interesting board, or maybe more interesting, but much more stupid board. For example, maybe my favorite prospect right now is Jermaine Johnson. <laughs> so just to give you an idea of how stupid it is. Speaking of Jermaine Johnson, got another note here. Um, apparently he was visiting. I forgot who it was. It was like the Giants or the Jets or something. He was just on a team visit. And he tweets out, this is April 7th, I don't need to talk. My tape does that and will continue to. Whoever drafts me, let's ball 100%. And the, the running assumption is he got absolutely crucified in this meeting. They're putting up a lot of his bad tape and asking him about it, and he was not happy about that. So, I mean, to be completely honest, that's probably not a great sign if he's running to social media basically saying, you know, I don't want to hear this. Not He doesn't take tough coaching would be my concern. If I'm a team, I want to know exactly what he's talking about here. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but he literally was just in a meeting with a team, and then he tweets that out. I don't need to talk. My tape does that and will continue to. So that's concerning, but maybe it's concerning enough that he falls to uh, 22, maybe he falls to 28. I don't know. Wouldn't be mad about it. But I like Jermaine Johnson, man. Jermaine Johnson is the edge rush version of Roquan Smith. Roquan, no. What the heck is his name? Raquan Davis. Raquan, not Roquan, Raquan. Who, by the way, is not doing very well in the NFL, but I don't care. I will always ride with Raquan Davis. When I, when I say a guy is my guy, he's my guy for Tease Tabor. Basically a bust since day one. He might be out of the league right now. It's my, that, that might be my first ever my guy. Love Tease Tabor, man. 
And one of these days, the Packers are going to draft one of my guys, and it's going to be a great day. Um, in addition to all this, I want to play a clip from you. This is um, Tony Pauline, who, again, is a guy I really like. Um, just in terms of, you know, going through this process, there's some people that you like or dislike or whatever. Pauline seems to be one of the more plugged-in guys. I mean, he, he kind of reminds me a little bit of, um, I can never remember the guy's name, Bob McGinn. Um, he, he's just, he's, he's got some pretty good sources. He's got some pretty good insights. And so um, as far as the, the media goes and their connection with what's actually going on, he's, he's up there at the top or near the top for me. Now, again, I want to remind you, when we talk about rising up the draft boards, we're not talking about actually rising up any boards. We're talking about us realizing where teams actually have these guys set. And it's funny because it kind of comes full circle because the wide receiver buzz is kind of new. This was always a deep edge rusher class. This was always a deep edge rusher class. But we kind of stopped talking about that, started talking about wide receivers, and um, I don't even know what else. That's just been the biggest buzz is wide receiver because, well, because the media cares about wide receiver. Wide receivers and quarterbacks are the only things that the media cares about, which is, it gets boring. But considering we're Packer fans and need wide receivers, we'll, we'll take it this year. For once, the media cares about the, the Packers, which is <laughs> unusual. There's been a lot of talking about the Packers this draft cycle, which never happens. But anyways, here's a clip, uh, Trey Wingo and Tony Pauline talking about the, this year's uh, biggest risers. Let's start, Tony, uh, with the position group that you think is rising faster than any other right now. Two of them, the pass rushers and the offensive tackles. We could potentially see four pass rushers come off the board within the first five picks of the, of the draft. Uh, Aiden Hutchinson, uh, Trayvon Walker of Georgia, Kayvon Thibodeau of Oregon, and Jermaine Johnson of uh, Florida State is going to go no. much earlier than people think. <laughs> could go four or five right now. If David Ajabu had not hurt himself, we could have potentially seen five pass rushers come off the board before the 10th pick of the draft. So the pass rushers are rising, and we're going to see a lot more pass rushers go earlier, not not just in the top 10, but I believe in the top six from what I'm hearing than what we previously thought. The offensive tackles are coming off the board, real quick, are going to come off the board quick too. Iquan, Iquan, Iquanaku of North Carolina State's going to go early. Yikes. Evan Neal's going to go early. As I reported on Pro Football Network earlier this week, Charles Cross is being considered with the sixth selection of the draft by the Carolina Panthers. Even Trevor Penning from Northern Iowa is going to make his way between selections 10 to 14. So we're going to have at least three offensive tackles chosen within the first 10 picks. We could have four within the first 10 picks. I think we will absolutely have four offensive tackles before the middle of round one is over. So those two positions are really rising faster than anyone right now projects. So we're talking about, in the first 10 picks, a minimum of what? Seven being between edge rushers and tackles? Four pass rushers, he said, possibly in the top five. So more than likely in the top 10, which is Jermaine Johnson, which makes me sad and, and whatnot. By the way, if there's one thing that I generally get right when it comes to film evaluation is pass rushers. There's always a guy I watch and it's like, why is it? Brian Burns? I watched Brian Burns. He was like a late first, early second round prospect. I said, I don't get it. He went much earlier and, and the buzz started on him. Bradley Chubb was a like potential Packers pick at the back of the first round or whatever. I don't know. Maybe it was the year we were higher. I don't know. But he was he was a late first round pick. And I said, this guy's my favorite pass rusher in the draft. He went, he was the first one taken. This year it's Jermaine Johnson. I don't get why he doesn't have more hype. Suddenly he might be a top five pick. I think that might be the only position that I, that's, that's my one superpower when it comes to uh, draft film evaluation. doesn't mean they're actually going to be good, but I guess projecting who the media that is going to eventually fall, or, or even the NFL is eventually going to fall in love with but not necessarily be good. <laughs> but, you know, and, and it kind of helps to shape um, our understanding of the draft and how these things are going to go. And, and again, the one thing I love is this is such a hard draft to predict. This is, this is the most throw your hands in the air, I don't know what's about to happen draft, maybe that I've, I've ever watched. Aiden Hutchinson seems like a lock at one, just because he's the, the clear number one guy and it's a premium position, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm not 100% sure that that's necessarily the best move. But after one, what do we know? Nothing. Nothing. I don't know if the, if the Lions could very well take Trayvon Walker. They could absolutely take Kayvon Thibodeau. Jermaine Johnson could be a surprise. 
Offensive line, I don't think makes the most sense, but it depends on what they think. I mean, they're they're huge about trenches, and if if they love an offensive tackle, maybe they could trade out of the spot. They could take a quarterback, and every surprise pick um, from then on changes what happens in the you know what the Lions do determines what the next picks do. So I the fact that I don't know what's going on at two, and I don't really know what's going on at three because especially when you got pass rusher and tackle, which are pretty equal in terms of need. The, the hilarious thing is right after that clip, Trey Wingo says, you know, the part of the reason is the positional value. And he says, if you rank the top five most important positions, he says, quarterback's number one, wide receiver's number two. And I was like, you are out of your freaking mind. Which again, goes to what we've been talking about forever. The overvaluing of wide receivers is insane. And I, I'm, I'm guessing he's not the only one thinking that. Not only is the media overly obsessed with wide receivers, I think there are teams that are over obsessed with wide receivers. The idea that a wide receiver is the second most important position. First of all, I know teams don't believe that because you don't, that, that's why you don't see wide receivers go number one ever. They will never take the best wide receiver. A generational wide receiver will never go before an elite pass rusher ever. You don't see wide, you see edge rushers and tackles and quarterbacks go number one. So the media's obsession with wide receiver is psychotic. Trey Wingo is out of his mind if he thinks wide receiver is the most important. Tackle, protecting the quarterback, edge rusher, sacking the quarterback, easily more, more important than wide receiver. He then says a cornerback is, is like number five, which wide receiver and corner should not be that different because we're talking about the same thing. It's the same reason why tackle and edge rusher are probably about equally as important because ultimately protecting the quarterback and sacking the quarterback are equally as important depending on what side of the spectrum you're on. Likewise, having a quarterback, uh, having a target for your quarterback and having somebody that can stop that target are probably equally important. But if I had to pick, a corner is more important than a wide receiver. But anyways, I, I heard that and I about choked on my own tongue. You guys are just ridiculous with this wide receiver stuff, I swear. Seriously, a team with a good tight end can get by with just garbage wide receivers. <laughs> How far is a team with a bad offensive line going to get? Probably not very. I mean, the Seahawks did fairly well for a while, but it was always a problem. No pass rushers. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know if there's an example of a team with no pass rushers. Tell me a team with no pass rushers that's a good football team. I'm talking, I mean, you could say the Rams if you just mean edge, but they have probably the best pass rusher in the NFL on their team. So that's not a good example. Um, as of April 8th, there was also talk of cornerback Gregory Jr., I guess. I don't know what that is. Uh, JJ reported it uh, out of Wichita Baptist for a visit, projects as a core special teamer. So maybe it's just Gregory Jr., but he accidentally put an M in there. Let me look him up. <laughs> Yeah, it's Gregory Jr. I don't even have him on my list because he's Wichita Baptist, um, and so I don't have any stats or anything on him. But uh, I see him on this um, scouting guide here. He uh, ran a 4 4 5, uh, 40, so he's got some speed. He's 5'11, 203 pounds, which is, you know, that's a corner. 22.85 years old. Watch out. He's, he's pushing 23, folks. But uh, Dane Brugler has him as his 30th corner. Uh, Vert was 39 and a half, broad jump 10-3, short shuttle 417, three cone 697, bench press was 18 reps. Just go to his overall thing. He has a sixth or seventh round grade on him, but his his overall junior needs to improve his anticipation and locate and locating skills to make more plays on the football. But he has outstanding balance in his transitions uh, with the toughness to play inside or outside while also playing on special teams. So obviously noting special teams on there is is important. But also saying there's a potential that, and, and that, it's not a bad thing. I mean, he's got the size, he's got the speed to play in the NFL, number one, right? The fact that he's also an outside-inside guy is important because the Packers may want to look at, you know, potentially putting him on the inside, if at all possible. You're looking for sort of that, um, that next Chandon Sullivan type, perhaps. But you get to sixth, seventh round, you're basically looking at special teamers that have a chance to play. I'm sure that's not how Brian Gutekunst would, would assess it. You know, no, he's a player first. But at the end of the day, that's kind of what we're talking about, I think, with Greg Jr. But 2021, first team all GAC, whatever whatever that is, Galactic Conference or whatever. <laughs> I, I don't care enough to look it up or make myself sound smart. I'm, I'm fine telling you I have no idea what the GAC is. General Athletic Conference, the Gymnastics Association Conference. It's probably one of those. I'm not sure which one. I'm, I, I'll stick with Galactic. That sounds good. Just a pipeline to the Space Force. Um, Tom Grossi did his, uh, annual interview with, uh, Mark Murphy. It's kind of funny. It was kind of blowing up. Some people were like, you know, it's amazing that this guy's gotten to the point where he's doing interviews with Mark Murphy. Now that's how big he's gotten. 
Tom Grassi has exploded, which is awesome. I mean, as I've said before, he is the, he is everything that people like me want to be. The guy that works really, really hard and uh, gets to the point where they can quit their job and then really put all their effort into it, put out great content, and explode. I also hate Tom Grassi because I sit here and watch uh, my YouTube channel die as uh, people who are about my size are now at like 20, 30,000 followers. And it's like, dang it, I got to get on freaking YouTube. But yeah, he's he's breezing past 300,000 like it's nothing. But point is, he's done this interview with Mark Murphy every single year, and I've always gotten great content out of it. I've, I've referenced um, some of the things that he's gotten out of Mark Murphy several times. And it's always fun listening because you listen to him and he's just got this sort of, it, it always makes me nervous because it's almost like it's almost like the fans pay more attention than he does, you know? And, and you kind of get that from Brian Gutekunst, too, and some of these other guys. And I, I know these guys are really good at their, at their job, but I, I think they just have such a different perspective of how they view things, and they're so process-driven that they don't really get into some of the things that we think about. But it's, And I, I haven't listened to the full interview, by the way, but that just launched last night. I'll, I'll listen to that today sometime. But you listen to some of the answers, and he sits there, and he's like, hmm, yeah, I, uh, I don't know. I guess that's kind of... Something we'll have to look at. I mean, you know, I guess you think about stuff like that. And you can tell he's never thought about it in his life. And it's like, how have you not thought about this? This is, you, what is happening right now? But that always, that always blows my mind and makes me extremely nervous. But again, I, I know that they're just, they're just extremely process driven and they just follow the process. And so they don't really need to get into all these crazy hypotheticals like we do. But the point is, the, the big thing that I got that was kind of leaked out, he, he did like a little teaser thing before his main uh, drop. But Mark Murphy, Mark, Mark Murphy had two things that kind of stood out. Number one was talking about Jordan Love. And this was, again, one of those like, I, I don't know, I haven't really thought about it things, but asking, do you think there's a scenario in which maybe you look at it and say, hey, we don't really know, know what's going on with Aaron Rodgers. Maybe we shouldn't we should hang on to him because if he ends up leaving sooner than we think, then um, maybe he ends up being the starter and he kind of just walked like, yeah, I, uh, psh, I guess. Yeah. Um, you know, we'll see. Um, but then he settled on, this is going to be a big preseason for him. Now, again, one of the, the most intriguing things whenever these guys do interviews is sometimes they forget what we don't know. And they, they kind of say things that shock us. And, and it's like, oh yeah, that's right. You guys didn't know that. The point is, though, there's a, a, a heavy assumption by a lot of people that, that Jordan Love may get dealt during the draft. Now, that still may happen, but clearly it's not even on the mind of Mark Murphy, who's very interested to see how Jordan Love, how he is during this upcoming offseason. That would tell me there are no plans to deal Jordan Love, right? And you could say that maybe he's just being a genius and is like, well, let's just say that so that the people don't know. I don't think so. I think he's just talking. I think it's, a, it, again, go watch it. You can see how laid back of, a, of an atmosphere and how unguarded he is. Mark Murphy really is, I don't understand the hate for Mark Murphy. I think he does a phenomenal job. Um, I think he's done, I mean, just even Titletown, he kind of gets picked on because like, oh, all you care about is Titletown. First of all, Titletown is incredibly important. We need to turn Green Bay, Wisconsin into a, a destination. And if that, if that means buying up every single house that becomes available, demolishing it and turning it into a hotel, fine, because we're never going to get events. We're never going to get the draft. We're never going to get any of this stuff until it kind of transforms. Now, listen, I don't want to turn it into a, a metropolis. There's something endearing about the fact that there are, you know, Lambeau Field is literally in certain people's backyards. But I mean, Titletown is such an unbelievable place. I mean, the, the condos there look beautiful. The, the ice skating rink and the sledding hill. And I mean, it's just, it's such a... I think he's done a great job of turning it into more than just a, a you know, small town, suburban little environment, but still keeping it small towny. You know what I mean? Like with the playground and, you know, it, it doesn't have like a big amphitheater kind of thing or, or whatever you might find in like Atlanta, you know, the, the big aquarium and the opera house. But it's 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 nice. And there are more accommodations. You got the Kohler Lodge and you've got some some other cool places that you can go. And the point is, we need to be able to host more things and, and have more people. And I, I think it's spectacular. But even beyond that, what he's done with the Green Bay Packers and, and you know, moving on from the guys that were here and changing the structure and bringing in, you know, the, the new GM and the new head coach and, and basically transforming the way the team is and, and to, to do such a great job of bringing in the right people. Again, because he understands the process and he knows what he's looking for. He knows what he wants. He's not an idiot. This guy knows what you need in a GM. You look at some of these owners, you know, there's talk about one of the Waltons might be buying, you know, one of the Walmart guys. Um, 
or one of their kids or whatever might be buying the Denver Broncos for like $4 billion. Do you think there's any way in the world those guys know anything about football? Now, again, they're going to hire football people, but who are you going to hire? Who, who's a good football person to hire football people? You don't know, do you? Because you're not a football person. The fact that we have a football guy that hires football guys. You need a football guy that understands enough football and how football works to be able to understand which GM you're, you're hiring that knows football. If you don't know football, you don't know which football guys to hire. And so I, I, I think Mark Murphy is a, a really fantastic guy. I, I, I don't understand why people dislike him. Um, I mean, I, I don't get the, the, the uh, Brian Gutekunst hate either. I don't get the Mark Murphy or the uh, Matt LaFleur. I don't think there's much, but there's a little bit because people like to be miserable. But I just, I don't get it. There, there seems to be a much greater disdain for Mark Murphy that just doesn't make any sense to me. But anyways, um, super ranty today. Let me rewind, figure out where we left off. What was I talking about? I've noticed I do that all the time, by the way, when I listen to my own podcast. I, I'm like, two points, and then I mention one thing, and I never go back. Or sometimes I don't even get to point one. And it's like, oh, you idiot. You idiot. You did it again. I do that all the time. I just, I, I should stop doing, like, I got two points on that. But anyways, back to my two points about this. Number one, um, I don't think that that was a planned out thing. I think that um, if there was a plan in the works to trade Jordan Love, there's a good chance that Mark Murphy would know about it. Maybe not, but there's a good chance. And he probably wouldn't have answered it that way because he knows in the back of his head, this guy might not be here for training camp. I probably shouldn't say, I can't wait to see him in training camp. We should probably stay away from that. He didn't say that, which means there's a good chance he doesn't know about that, which means there's a good chance that it's not a a thing that's on the table right now. Number two, he mentioned, and, and again, this is one of those things where I think he's just being unguarded and didn't really you know, he's not really thinking about, he's not protecting what he says enough, which is bad for them, good for us. He referenced Aaron Rodgers' contract situation as being year to year. Now, we've been looking at this in terms of, is it five years? Is it three years? Everyone's telling us it's three years. Maybe it's two. Maybe he phrased it as it's a, it's a year to year deal, right? Meaning this could very well be the last year. And I think from that perspective, if you think about it, because if you listen to Ken Ingalls or whatever, he's kind of mentioned that three years makes the most sense in terms of what you would call this deal most accurately. But really what it sounds like it is, is a deal that can't go beyond three years. Because it, as he described it, and I haven't looked into it enough to understand how this all works or how it, I mean, I kind of understand how it makes sense, but I, I don't fully understand it. But if you go beyond three years, it becomes completely untenable. And again, his, his description is the longer he stays, the more expensive it gets. So in reality, this could absolutely be a one-year deal. It could be a two-year deal. And it sounds like if we get to about three years, they need to start talking about restructuring how this thing works, if he even gets that far. So um, anyways, yeah, so definitely go check that video out by Tom Grassi. I have not done that yet, but um, I'm sure there's going to be some really solid nuggets in there. He always does a really good job with that. And I love how unguarded Mark Murphy is. I mean, he... <sighs> I, I, I really think, on top of understanding football, he really, at his core, understands Green Bay. He understands the culture here, and, and he makes that a priority. He, he makes it a priority that Green Bay has to stay Green Bay. And even if we're going to turn this into some kind of a metropolis, it's going to be a small-town metropolis, and he's done that. But the fact that he's so accessible, right, on, on a team that is small-town, and it's close, and it's intimate, and it's, you know, the, the, the fans own the team, and it, it just has a different kind of feel to it. He's the kind of guy that's going to be an open book, and he's going to allow people in. And he's, you know, he has the, the ask, what is it, ask Murphy or ask Mark or whatever the thing is on Packers.com. He makes himself accessible because he understands that that's just how things should be here. I love that. I think, I think he does a phenomenal job. I really do. Um, finally, one little tiny tidbit of a note here, and this is all, man, these notes are supposed to be five minutes, and then we're going to get to the the mocks. The USFL debuted, this is via Field Yates, USFL debuted a digital technology that will be using to measure first downs in place of chains, and the NFL needs to follow suit and start using digital technology yesterday. In other words, they've done what we've been talking about for 10 years. The other thing that annoys me is you got guys like Field Yates and a bunch of other people reporting it like, whoa, this is brilliant. Why didn't we think of this? It's like, we did. We did. I've said it on this podcast like 17 times. This is not a new concept. We've been talking about, like, why don't you just put a chip in the freaking ball? Now, granted, it's still not going to be a perfect system, but I think people will accept it much more. The benefit of something like this is it's a freaking computer. So you can sit there and say, that's a bad spot. That's a terrible spot. Really? Because it's literally to the millimeter. 
telling you where the ball is. And the, the other thing that's kind of cool is is the biggest objection I would have, and um, sorry about the empty, I'm trying to find the full can. I've got, got a little bit of a collection of monsters over here, so probably not the most healthy thing in the world, but I'm tired. Anyways, um, the thing that's kind of, it just dawned on me, one thing you could do is if you have a timestamp, and you have a timestamp for the ball that is, again, chipped, and I don't know if you'd have to chip both sides of the whole ball or how that, that works as far as sensors, but if you have a timestamp and you can say, well, his knee was down here, you go to the exact millisecond of when you say, okay, this is where his knee's down, and then you see where the ball is. Boom, problem solved. Even though it's not 100%, it's still the most accurate way to do it. And anybody talking about human element can go pound sand. I don't understand. I hear that with baseball all the time. I care about the human element. So do I. I care about the human element of the quarterback, the running back, the wide receiver, the safety, the corner. I care about the human element of the people playing the game. The referees are not playing the game. If we could eliminate the referees entirely, that would be ideal. They're not a part of the game. They're not. Well, they are. No, they're not. They are absolutely not. The two teams are the people that are in the game. The fans are more a part of the game than the referees are, right? You got home field advantage with the noise and everything else. That, that is a part of the game that everybody wants and acknowledges should be a part of the game and is, is a great aspect of the game. The referees are an interference to the game. They're there just to make sure everybody does this, that, or the other. If we could put, put microchips in everything, perfect. The only problem with that is there's going to be offsides and false starts and holding penalties on every single play, but we'll work through that. You know, We'll put a little bit of, uh, a little bit of leeway in there. You can grab this much. <laughs> Anyways, we got to take a break here, and actually, we've got a special guest on the other side of the break that I want to get to first. Um, he's going to do some film evaluation for us really quickly. It's just a very quick uh, interview. Um, he is a, a really talented scout. I've done some work with him the last several days, last several weeks watching film, um, and so we'll get some breakdowns from my son. And then we'll look at some prospects. It's going to be a long episode. But again, make sure you check out the GoFundMes. Head over to amodernfrontier.com. Use promo code MEATPACKER, one word, all caps. Get $25 off your order. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's us days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. All right, Colleen, ready? Yeah. Tell me about... The Packers first. Who, how do you think they're going to do this year? Well, I think they're going to be better. Better than last year? Are they going to win the Super Bowl? No idea. <laughs> Who's your favorite player? Well, it was Devontae until he went away. And now it's Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers. Uh, how about on defense? Do you have a favorite defensive player? Jair. Jair. Well, what corner do you want to play when you get big? Mm-hmm. What Did I say what corner do you want to play? What position do you want? Cullen wants to be a corner when he gets older. That's his favorite thing. Every time we play catch, I just want him to catch the ball, and he's like, no, try to get it past me. So I always got to try to throw it on the couch, and he has to either intercept it or block it. I don't know. He made up that game, and he's obsessed with it. So he's he's born to be a corner, I guess. I don't know. Um, What else is I going to ask you? Uh, Let's talk about the, uh, the draft coming up, because I can't remember any other questions. 
What position do you think the Packers need to do the most? What's most important? Well, they need to get wide receiver. Wide receiver is probably most important. We watched a bunch of wide receivers. We watched 10 of them. Um, you like all these guys, right? Yeah. They're all really, really good. But you ranked some of the guys that you think are your best. Um, the top three guys all have one thing in common. What is it? They're all in number one. Yeah, they're all ranked number one, which is kind of – Cullen always knows players by their number. He's very observant. He notices the down and distance, all that. He's better at scouting than I am. He notices every little thing. So he wants to know their number. So when we took notes on everybody, I had to also put their number down so you could remember them. And his top three guys are number one. Um, do you know who number three was, the really, really fast guy that you liked? Remember his name? Um, James Jameson. Williams. Jameson Williams, yeah, exactly, Alabama. That was his number three guy. Super, super fast, right? What about number two? you remember this guy's name? George Pickens. George Pickens was Colin's second favorite, which is probably probably my first or second favorite, too. I really like George Pickens. By the way, he has no idea what's going on on social media, so he's not he's not like this is what everybody else thinks. This is completely just we just sat down, we watched some guys, and he told me who his favorite was, which I love. It's, it's the most pure thing I've seen when, in this draft cycle because there is zero – concern for everybody else's opinion what about your number one favorite wide receiver the guy that cullen was pretending to be all yesterday when we played football in the backyard remember his name christian christian watson christian watson yep we had we we worked on our deep routes yesterday because he was uh six foot four and was running really really fast down the field he got pretty good at it too so Christian Watson is your favorite wide receiver, then George Pickens, then Jamison Williams. What What is another important thing the Packers need, you think, aside from wide receiver? Pass rusher. There you go. So we watched edge rushers. I'm not – I promise I didn't push it. This, is, this was all what his decision was yesterday. We watched three different things. He wanted an edge rusher. Um, we watched eight of these guys. Two of them were tied. Cullen was obsessed with ties yesterday. I think his brain was getting tired, so he just said everybody was a tie. But you had Trayvon Walker and Kayvon Thibodeau were tied, which is pretty smart because a lot of people kind of agree with that. But your um, third favorite guy that you really, really like, which again is funny because a lot of Packer fans like this guy too, who's your number three favorite guy? Boye Mafe. Boye Mafe, yeah. Well, do you remember what you like about Boye Mafe? Super strong. Super strong, yeah. All these guys are super strong. What about number two, your second favorite guy, which is probably your dad's favorite guy? He's extremely strong. Extremely strong. You remember his name? Jermaine, Jermaine Johnson. Like Jermaine Johnson, he's just an absolute monster. And I'm pretty sure I didn't bait him into that, saying Jermaine Johnson is his second favorite, but it's kind of hard to hide my emotions. And then the number one, your favorite pass rusher was who? Do you remember his name? 97? Uh, Aiden, Aiden Hutchinson. Hutchinson. Yeah, we didn't watch him a lot because obviously we're not going to get him. But um, So you had Aiden Hutchinson was his favorite, then Jermaine Johnson, the super strong guy. And Boye Mafe was his third favorite. And then the third most important thing you wanted the Packers to get, you remember what position it was? The guys that are blockers and receivers? Tight end? Tight end. Tight end, yes. there you go. That's exactly what say. <laughs> um, all right, so we watched, what, eight of these guys. And again, you like all of them, right? Yeah. They're all really good. Who was your favorite? Remember his name? Number 85. All, all, your two favorite guys are both number 85, too. Yeah. Which is funny. Maybe you just like the numbers a lot. Who's your favorite guy's name? Uh, no. Trey. Trey McBride. Trey McBride. There you go. What do you like about Trey McBride? He's fast. And? Strong. Fast and strong, which is pretty much most of these guys, right? The second guy that you liked is, remember his name? That's a really tricky name. Jalen. Jalen Watson. Weidermeyer. Weidermeyer. Yeah, it's a goofy name. But that guy's another really, really big and strong guy. And then we watched his third favorite guy, which is number 88, because we watched him block a guy into the next century. His name is Jeremy Ruckert. Remember that guy? Yeah. We really liked him because he was pretty good at catching the ball, too. He had like a one-handed catch in the end zone that was really impressive. But when we saw him knock a guy out blocking, I think he moved up Cullen's board pretty fast. And then there was one other guy you really liked because of his number. Who was that? Number zero. Number zero, Jelani Woods. Who is, remember what he was? Extremely big. He's a huge monster, Jelani Woods. So he's number five on Cullen's board, but still really like him because he's just a monster and would be a lot of fun. So thanks for hanging out, Cullen. We'll do this again, okay? We've got to scout some other positions. We'll do linebacker and stuff. Yeah. All right, man. Thanks a lot. So a little bit of inside baseball here. I, I feel kind of terrible. We did that interview last night, and um, being a garbage father, I deleted it on accident this morning. And so I went upstairs when I realized that, and he just woke up. And I was like, hey, you want to redo it? So he is 
he is pretty tired. It is 6.30 in the morning. He did not have breakfast yet. And I'm like, hey, let's just uh, let's just knock that out again real quick. So slightly less enthusiasm than normal for Cullen talking about football. But he, <laughs> he's tired and he's like, I already answered these questions yesterday. Why are you asking me these stupid questions? And I still got the questions messed up. All right, um, let's use our last few minutes here. I want to go through a few more of these mocks. And again, I want to kind of focus on really highlighting some of the prospects and um, kind of getting to know them a little bit. First challenge I got here is remembering where I left off. So if I skip you, I'm sorry. I just want to make sure I don't repeat things. Let's start with Kyle Sheehy. 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 Hmm. Anyways, I'm not here to judge Kyle. By the way, I'm completely abandoning the whole um, best and worst thing because I kind of want to just look at the prospects. So I, I can kind of tell he's going for um, just annoying me. Whenever you start off with Devin Lloyd, um, it just is what it is. But <laughs> maybe not. Maybe he's just, I don't know. But I want to kind of move down a little bit. We, we we know about Devin Lloyd. We know about Chris Olave. We know about Christian Watson. And I, I it hurts my brain to even think about talking about them anymore. But let's talk about DeMarvin Leal real quick. Because with a lot of these guys, what I'm finding out is, and I mentioned this, I don't know, yesterday or what, but I get an idea in my head and it just sticks there. And I forget why that's even there. And then it gets exaggerated. So if I kind of don't really like some, like Christian Watson. I kind of decided that nah, it's probably just a small school thing. It's not, and then by the end of it, he's just a, basically a bust. And it, anyone that thinks he's going to be good is an idiot. And then I go, went back and watched him again. I'm like, no, he's he's good at football, dude. Like this is not this is not just MVS. He's not like a late first round or late fifth round pick. That's uh, you know all just size and speed, but nothing else. I mean, this this dude can play football. So I'm trying to not get stuck on that. But Demarvin Leal is one of those guys that I watched about eight seconds of him. I decided I didn't like him. I forget why I decided I didn't like him. And since then, every time I see him, I'm like, oh, that, that guy sucks. I don't care. I don't even know why. I, I don't remember anything about the guy. The only thing I can think is he is one of those tweeners that we draft because he's quote unquote versatile, but he's not actually versatile. He's a tweener, which means he's too much of an def- interior guy to be an exterior guy or uh, edge rusher guy. He's too much of an edge rusher to be an interior guy. He is essentially a Ted Thompson pick because Ted Thompson loved drafting tweeners at, along the defensive line. I'm thinking guys like Dayton Jones, you know what I mean? That's what sticks in my head. He's Dayton Jones. Like, he's kind of a 4-3 defensive end. We're going to try him on the interior, or, you know, we'll try him as an outside linebacker, and then when that doesn't work, we'll kick him inside, and then he gets a little bit better until we decide it's just not working out, and then we ship him off to the Vikings, and he does a little bit better there, but he's still not super great. For some reason, like, I saw him, and I'm like, nope, that's Dayton Jones. I don't want him. But let's dig a little deeper, shall we? Because I want to make sure that when I say... I'm going to like the Packers picks. That means if we take DeMarvin Leal at pick 28, I'm not going to flip something. And considering this guy's sitting at pick 46, that is exactly where the picker, the, the pickers, the Packers love to pick in the first round. Mid-second round guys, right around this range. I mean, you got guys like Savage, you got guys like um, Stokes. I mean, this, this, is their, this is their sweet spot right here. But generally seen as a defensive tackle, PFF lists him as an edge rusher because that's what he does Primarily, he is an edge rusher, six foot three, two hundred and eighty-three pounds. He's a big dude, which generally the Packers they like these, you know, two sixty, two seventy, two eighty pound edge rush guys. They also do like versatility. If you look at his snap counts, primarily he was a left defensive end, which is four down lineman. He's the guy furthest on the left with his hand in the dirt. That's what he did, one hundred and seventy-three times, one hundred and seventy-three out of you know almost seven hundred, which doesn't seem like much. But then you figure he was on the right side with his hand in the dirt about 200 times. So we're talking almost 400 out of 700 snaps. The next highest was 95 snaps interior right defensive tackle, which is 4-3 defensive tackle. Then you have left defensive tackle 79 times, nose tackle, which is 3-4 guy in the middle 43 times, uh, outside linebacker 28 times. So in terms of scheme fit, and again, you know, you, you can kind of project out from what he's done, it's it's not the greatest fit in the world. Again, I know we play a lot of, you know, sub package. So there's four guys with guys in the, with their hand in the dirt. So from that standpoint, he would fit, but he still needs to be able to stand up and be good at that. Otherwise, when we have our base package and he needs to be a down defensive interior guy. And, and the question is, can he do those things? Is he a stand up guy? Can he be, and can he do all these things and how well? But just Peeking at his PFF real quick, um, 2020 was kind of his best year. So Texas A&M, three years, his grades were 68, 88, and then back down to a 70. So it's 
one of those things where if 2020 was the year he came out, he'd probably be much higher, but then he kind of regressed again. Um, 70.3 overall grade, 67 run defense grade, 74 pass rush grade, 37 pressures on 412 attempts, which very quick math, not great. Now, again, most people can't see pressures. What they see is sacks, which is nine. So when you get close to 10, people are like, oh, this guy's pretty good. But obviously we know that sacks can be inflated or deflated. It's not that big of a number in my mind. Now, the other question is, again, I said I want to start doing this more often, looking at the um, true the true pass sets. Looking at his true pass sets, he actually has an 80 overall pass rush grade, which is a pretty significant jump. He has 20 pressures out of 109 attempts, which is 18.3%, which is a lot higher. But again, I have to kind of recalibrate my scale because most people are a lot higher. Just to give you some perspective, if you look at some of the ed- other edge rushers, It's actually still relatively low. Um, I have him on my defensive tackle sheet, so I have to move him over. But that would put him, just based on his pressure rate, 26th on this list out of 46. Um, That would be just one spot behind George Karloftis, one spot ahead of Jermaine Johnson. So all those guys are relatively low in terms of pressure rate and true pass sets. Um, Alex Wright leads that category with 32.26%. Kingsley Enigbare out of South Carolina, 29%. So it kind of seems like 20%, when you're talking true pass, set, true pass sets, roughly speaking, and I got to kind of recalibrate this a little bit in my brain, but 20% is like the new 10%. In terms of his run defense, again, 67.5%, a little bit more insight into that. Um, his missed tackle percentage is 13.7%. It seems pretty high, but that's about middle of the pack. Um, that's... It's, it's straight smack dab in the middle, so it's not that bad. Stop percentage, what percentage of the time are you making a an impactful play? 8.3%. It's actually quite high. 8.3 would be tied for 11th. Aiden Hutchinson and Jeffrey Gunter are at 8.3%. So, 8 point, so as far as his impact in the run, making an impactful tackle, you know, stopping short of the first down marker or whatever, pretty solid. Uh, also, his average depth of target is 1.5 which is also pretty solid for an edge rusher. So clearly, when you look at the metrics, although his grade is not fantastic, which uh, speaks to other things, the statistics are pretty decent. So my thought on DeMarvin Leal, and again, you got to watch the film and kind of assess things or whatnot, which I have not done, and I probably won't, but there isn't a lot that's super redeemable about DeMarvin Leal in terms of his production. On top of that, the guy's RAS is a 7.43. So you know, as much as we can look at it and say, you know, he's a he's a a guy that is large and he's he's an outside inside guy, so that kind of fits the Packers. At the same time, I don't know that he's a great fit. I think his best fit is to be, you know, for example, on the Bears, who are now playing a four or three defense, looking for that true guy to to put his hand in the dirt and fire off the edge that we need to replace Khalil Mack, who used to be our top edge rusher, but is not but is also a better scheme fit. I think this is the better scheme fit. Again, he has the versatility, but I think you want to, I don't think you want him in a position where you try to make it harder, much harder than it was in college. Obviously that's necessary in the NFL, but that's kind of my point. It's already going to be harder. Let's focus in on the thing you do really well, the thing that you are, and just make you good at that one thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of all the way out on him. I'm going to have to, if you have any reason why you really, really like the guy, maybe you think he should just stay inside. Everybody lists the guy as a defensive tackle, despite the fact that he just wasn't. I don't know why he's always considered defensive tackle. On the consensus big board, he's a defensive tackle. On um, the RAS thing, he's a defensive tackle. On the Beast NFL Draft Guide, he's a defensive tackle. But, I mean, in college, he was he was an edge rusher. So I don't really know. But um, I can't get into it. And, and and as a defensive tackle, he's 283. So he's a really, I mean, he's, first of all, he's short and and light. A lot of these guys that are like 280s, 290 or whatever, they're like 6'6". Six, six. There's like a prototype, you know, the 6'5", 285 pound pass rushing interior guy. This guy's 6'3", 283. I don't know. I, I, I can't get into it at all. But hey, he's 21 and age is the most important thing this year. That's what I've learned from this draft cycle. After that, we've got Abraham Lucas, um, and again, I've, it's another one where I see Washington State, and I just go, eh, Washington State, I don't know. Now, I don't even know if they run the same offense that they used to, so so this might just be a complete moot point, my entire complaint about Abraham Lucas. 
But if you're if you're not worried about the scheme, you got a guy that's six six, three fifteen, at least that's what he's listed here. I don't know his official weight, but his grade 75, 85, 80, and then basically 80. So very consistent. Clearly a better pass blocker than run blocker. But again, I always get nervous about that with Washington State because it's supposedly easier to block there. So I mean, th- this is one of those things where you you have to you have to do film evaluation. It's just like Christian Watson and all the small school guys. Like the the, the stats and grades are going to be great. You have to be able to watch and see. You know that this is a Coach Hahn question, but his pass blocking grades: eighty five, eighty eight, eighty, and then ninety one this past year. His run blocking, however, sixty two, seventy four, seventy five, sixty eight. So, you know, just based off of that. All the guys that I really like, they've got the athleticism. Clearly, they're good pass blockers, but they got the mean, nasty run blocking attitude. Now, Abraham Lucas is a right tackle, but I don't know that he has the right tackle mentality. You know, looking at our handy dandy uh, draft guide here, six six three fifteen. He was six six three sixteen on his pro day, four nine two forty. And even if you just get into it you, right away when you look at the weaknesses. So again, this is the same system that I'm describing. It says, played in a pass-happy scheme at WSU with limited run-blocking reps on his film. Not explosive or rangy when executing poles or climbs. Late with his hands and adjustments in the run game, especially on the move. So, I mean, we can go through all the strengths and all that kind of stuff, but that is my concern. If you're a right tackle, I want you to get in there. You got to get dirty, and you got to be a good run-blocker. And I just, I think you're kind of starting from, from... from ground level with him. Now, certain teams, you know, I mean, if you're Kansas City or something, do I care that much? You know, we could use a right tackle. This guy's a, a premier pass blocking guy. This is all he did 24-7 was pass block, even though it might be a slightly different kind of scheme, you know, what whatever. I don't I don't care as much. But if you're the Green Bay Packers or the San Francisco 49ers or a team that actually cares about running the ball and running the ball well, the Baltimore Ravens, I don't think I want Abraham Lucas all that much. The summary says, overall, Lucas is not an explosive mover and his hand exchange must improve versus NFL competition, but he has massive frame and balance athleticism to uh, to keep his man blocked. He projects as a low ceiling starter, right tackle in the NFL. No, thank you. At pick 132, we've got Isaiah Thomas, edge rusher out of Oklahoma. On my big board, he is the third best Thomas, ranking 25th on my board out of 46 pass rushers. At a glance, doesn't really stand out in any real category. Um, missed tackles. He has a four out of 10, 31% missed tackle rate, which is horrific. Uh, his pass rush grade is a 68, which is pretty low. His win percentage, 15.3%. Again, extremely low. Pressure percentage, 16%. As I said, 20 is kind of the new 10. Uh, but he does have a 915 RAS. So again, you get that athletic guy that is uh, athletic. So you got some athleticism with his athleticness. So we'll read the quick and skinny on this guy here. Overall, Thomas has subpar get-off quickness and finish skills, but he has NFL-level size, length, and strength to be a rotational defensive end in a 4-3 base defense kicking inside in sub-packages. Again, doesn't fit. I know, goal, I know the goal is to like these guys, I just I, I can't. So and Then he picks up center Luke Fortner. I, I tell you what, this guy's winning um, all things in terms of doing the worst mock draft. He then picks a center out of Kentucky, Luke Fortner. He does project as a third-round pick, so there's that. He got him at pick 140. And actually, of, of all the guys that uh, you've picked so far, this one could actually pan out. He's a center that's built for his own blocking scheme and is a potential guard going forward. The problem is he's 24 years old. He did play a good amount of guard. He actually, I mean, you know, 24 years old, redshirted in 2016, um, played in 2017 and 18, but didn't start until 2019. So he's he's in year four. He started all 13 games at right guard, 2020. Played and started all 10 games, seven games at right guard, three games at left guard, and then 2021 played all 13 games at center. So he's got a good amount of experience at guard. So um, I'm going to give you points for Luke Fortner, man. Again, age is kind of the issue, but 6'4", 307, doesn't have elite. What is his RAS here? 725. I mean, for a mid-round guy, that's not the worst thing in the world. So as long as it's not like a four or something. Then at pick 170, we got Verone McKinley the third. I actually have him third. 13th, well, 12th, because Darnell Savage is still on this list. So I have him 12th on my list uh, out of Oregon. So I've actually got him quite high on here. Um, and that's even without, I wonder if he did his, um, he did, he's got his R, let me see if I can find his RAS. He might move up my board a little bit. Oh no, he's going to go down. 2.3 is his RAS. Never mind. Because I always put in the filler of six. So I assume he's going to go up because six is relatively low. That's terrible. So that drops him down to 17th now with a RAS that is disqualifable, 4.67, 40 time. He's 5'10", 198, 
Four three eight shot. I mean, that's that's horrific. Man, this is a great mock. Unfortunately, I, I I should have picked one that was meant to be impressive. So they're not. He did such a good job of picking terrible prospects. And I really apologize if you meant for this to be a good um a good mock because then I'm just being extremely rude. But I am impressed. Just take the compliment, man. But on Dane Brugler's board, he has him twelfth overall. His summary says, overall, McKinley lacks ideal size and speed based on what the NFL looks for, but he is an instinctive cover man with ball skills and play timing that should translate to the next level. His game reminds me of former Seattle Seahawks safety Tedrick Thompson, fourth or fifth round grade he has on him, and that's after his his terrible 40 and short shuttle and three cone and everything else, so um, he obviously has something good going on. Then he gets Tyquan Thornton at 228, which is a really popular pick. I have Taekwon 11th on my board, which is pretty high based on, you know, where most people would have him. 83 overall offensive grade, 82 overall receiving grade. Um, his yards after the catch isn't great, but that's, I mean, I think Olave is kind of the same thing, but that's largely just because he catches it and goes down, right? I mean, there are op- obviously situations where he's going to outrun people after the catch, but generally if there's somebody next to him when he catches it, he's not going to break any tackles. He's just going to go straight down. Uh, his yards per route run wasn't terrible, 2.5, which is a 6 out of 10. Uh, his drop percentage, 4.6, so he actually has pretty good hands. That's an eight, uh, 8.62 out of 10. And surprisingly, contested catch rate is 55.6%, so better than average contested catch rate. Um, his passer rating when targeted, 120.3, which obviously is very, very high. One of the things people really like about him is a potential special teamer. In his uh, four-year career, he had nine kickoff returns, zero punt returns. Um, His longest was 27 yards. He averaged 15.3. So based on that, he really wasn't a very good kick returner. Um, He also didn't grade out very well just as a special teamer, which would be Gunner or any other kind of thing. So um, I know he's liked for those things. I don't know that he's actually proven that concept of being good at that, but that's something people think about. But uh, the biggest thing with Taekwon, obviously, is his 4-2-8-40 time. Obviously was a standout track star in, in high school and everything else. Four-star recruit coming out of high school. But his overall um, summary here says, Thornton will have a tougher time uh, masking his lack of build or play strength versus NFL competition, but his speed plays at any level. And his mid-air adjustment skills could be what keep him on an NFL roster. So he's got speed and he's got a good ability to catch the ball. You know, body control, good hand. In other words, he's, he's a one-trick pony. He does one thing, but I I think, or the consensus is, he does it well enough that he can do it in the NFL. He's fast enough to get by people, and he's good enough as a as a catcher to catch passes consistently enough. Probably not going to get away from anybody, but he's, he's, he's MVS is what he is. He does one thing well, and that is keeping defenses on their heels. You have to account for him, whether you want to or not. Is he a great football player? No. But if you don't keep that safety in check, we're going to run past you and our quarterback can throw to him and he can catch footballs. So there you go. That's all you need to know to keep that safety back. Anyways, final pick here at 249, Jerrion Ely running back out of Ole Miss. Five foot eight, 189, obviously not exactly the kind of build the Packers generally like. He does actually have some decent returns, um, 35 times as a kick returner. So it's something to uh, keep in mind. About 24 yards per attempt. He doesn't grade out super well, but again, all you're really looking for is a guy that can get 25 yards, and he's at 24.9 as a career average. Um, He does have two kick return touchdowns to his name. So um, something to maybe consider for a guy like Jerry and Ely, you know, if the Packers think enough of him that maybe he could be on a roster as a rotational guy, I don't know. But uh, the grades look fantastic out of Ole Miss. 74, 88, and 86 are his grades over three years. Rushing grades, 75, 90, and 87. Averages 5.9 yards per attempt. Only had five touchdowns, but again, he's probably probably not your goal line back, obviously. So I'm guessing all of his five touchdowns came on big breakaways. Another big question like uh, with a guy like this is his receiving ability. And he had an 85 overall receiving grade, 82 overall drop grade, meaning he has, he has solid hands. 6.8 yards per reception, two receiving touchdowns, caught 91.4% of the passes thrown at him. Um, four per, four point six percent of the time he was in the slot, so he does get split out occasionally. Nine yards after the catch per reception, which obviously is pretty fantastic. I mean, he's he's a small, shifty guy. He's a small, shifty guy that you could use as a kick returner. Uh, I, I mentioned Darren Sproles earlier. He's he's Darren Sproles. <laughs> he's a small, shifty guy that you can use as a receiver and as a kick returner. 
and probably be good in that limited capacity. The, the only issue with the Packers is they, as much as I like guys like this, I like guys where it's like, hey, you can do one thing, but you're good at it, so go get them. The Packers are like, no, I don't want a guy to go out there and the defense is like, oh, I know what you're doing. Or at the very least, I know what you're not doing. They want guys that can do everything. When they're on the field, you don't know. When Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon are on the field, even though they're very different styles of running backs, you have no idea what they're doing because they do the same stuff. It could be an outside run, an inside run. We could split them out in the slot. We can split them out wide. We can have them run routes out of the backfield. We could have them block out of the backfield. I mean, they do the exact same stuff, even though they're built different. So generally, the Packers don't really like the 5'8", 189, two-trick ponies, I guess. But interesting prospect enough. I mean, it's one of those guys, if they did pick up Ely in the late rounds, although I'm going to completely forget his name, um, I'll probably be pretty excited about that potential. So it's something to keep an eye on. Um, just a, a, a really talented guy that the Packers generally don't like because he's not a three-down back. But anyways, um, again, I want to try to keep clipping along with looking at other prospects, getting to know some other people's names, some of the positives, some of the negatives. Get to know guys like Jerry and Ely. Get to look a little closer at Taekwon. What are we actually getting with Taekwon? And, th- and that is kind of my assessment right now with Taekwon. He's, he's a faster MVS, but he's kind of just MVS. I don't think he would ever be more than that, but do we care? I mean, if we can replace the $10 million man with a late round pick, that's pretty freaking awesome. And I, and I have to think that's one of the easiest things in the world to replace. And granted, he wasn't exactly that, and he had learned the offense and all these things that go along with it. But at the end of the day, the one thing he did well was run fast in a straight line. And he wasn't even good at catching the... I mean, he was. I mean, Aaron Rodgers couldn't throw to him, which is an Aaron Rodgers problem. But regardless, it didn't work in terms of getting the ball down there to him very often. So if we're really just talking about send the guy down the field really fast to keep the defense spread out, just grab the 4-2 guy in the fifth round and be done with it. Paying freaking $10 million for that? Are you out of your mind? You know how many track stars we can get that can do that? But anyways, I got to get going. You folks have yourselves a fantastic Sunday. I will talk to you tomorrow. Keep your eyes and ears peeled for um, some shows that we got coming up. We got the draft show tomorrow. We may have a show coming up tonight. I don't know. We'll see. Hopeful. Fingers crossed. But um, I will talk to you tomorrow either way. Have a good one. Bye-bye.